Good morning, Grace. My name is Paul Adam, and I'm a leadership board member here at the church, and I want to welcome you to this morning's service. My wife, Erin, and our young daughters, Grace and Hazel, have been members here for some time at the church. I got thinking in the last few weeks as I was on vacation about the solid rock that God has um, provides us to build our lives on. We had a chance to go to Thunder Bay um, to visit friends. We actually met in a small group here at the church. During one of our day trips, we went to Eagle Creek Canyon, where they have suspension bridges that go from one side of the canyon to the other. Um, the suspension bridge is 600 feet long, and it's 225 feet from the canyon floor to the bottom of the bridge. If you know me, you know I don't like heights. Leaving the solid footing on the one side and crossing that bridge, my feet didn't stop. As soon as they left that rock, they kept going till they got to solid rock on the other side. It took everything to get across. The same comfort and the same peace and uh, sureness I found on that other side of the rock is the same feelings I have in my relationship with God. He has created a foundation that cannot be shaken for us to build our lives upon. I want to read to you Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fail because it has its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. It fell with a great clash. My encouragement for you today is that whatever you're going through, whatever season you find yourself in right now, that you're reminded of the constant uh, grace of God, and reminded of the foundation he has created for you. My prayer is that you'll go into this week fresh and renewed because of the strong footing you stand on. The God of today is the same God of Abraham and Jacob, steadfast in love and grace. As the old hymn goes that most of you will know, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the strong foundation you've given us. Thank you for your unwavering love and your steadfast grace. You, God, are great, and we just take this time to come and worship you, to thank you for all you've done and all you will do. Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak to each of us here. Allow us to hear the message and take from it what we need. In your Son's name we ask it. Amen. Welcome to church. I 
love your voice You have led me through the fire Darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so is running after, running after me, with my life laid down on surrender. Of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. All my life, all my life you have been so. goodness of God I'm gonna sing of your goodness My name is Christy Cowan. I've been attending Grace with my family for the last nine and a half years. Uh, Becky has asked me to share a little bit about the volunteer teams that I serve on. I actually serve on two different teams, uh, the first one being the welcome team. I've been on it since last fall um, when Becky was looking for new volunteers and I was looking for some new ways of connecting socially um, after months of being at home with a pandemic. So the welcome team was a great fit for that, been able to connect well with the rest of the team members, meet lots of new faces at the church, and just uh, be part of that community on a Sunday morning. It's really beautiful. The other team that I'm in is Just Right, which we've heard a lot about these past few months. Um, I've been with Just Right since it first started back in 2018. I remember feeling super excited and almost emotional when it was first being talked about. Uh, missions have always played a huge role in my life. I spent my childhood years growing up on overseas on the mission field as a missionary kid 
and I've been involved in several different international and intracity outreaches as an adult. So Just Right was a really natural way for me to fit in with the church. I've also had a lot of my own personal moments of crisis in my life, um, whether that be financial or medical, and I have been on the receiving end of these gifts of mercy coming from other people in the body of Christ. And it's beautiful to be on the receiving end of that. And so now to be able to be on the giving end of that and to be able to help facilitate giving these gifts to people within our own city who are struggling, it just blesses me all around. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's the body of Christ working together to love one another the way that we should. So I'll cherish your rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to your rugged cross And exchange someday for a crown I will, I will cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost Well, I'm really looking forward to actually speaking through a room uh, with people in it. Um, Brian Bitten's here, so I don't know what you would consider him, but anyhow. I struggle with how to uh, begin <laughs> a message that's recorded, and I thought today, how about yo? Uh, I'm Mark Brown, a long-term member of Grace. Uh, I've had the pleasure of sharing a bit of my Proverbs 3 story with you over these last uh, few months. And uh, if you're getting a little bored with my repetition, today's your lucky day because I'm going to end it off today. So let's start by reading in its entirety one more time, Proverbs 3, 1 to 10 from the NIV. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. 
<clears throat> and here is the teaching. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So over these last three months and finishing up today, I've asked a series of questions taken from this teaching of Solomon to his kids. I was corrected actually in the last couple of weeks that it's not a teaching to his kids in keeping with the culture of the day. It was a teaching for his sons. And when I thought about it, I said, I thought perhaps that's true because likely his daughters didn't need so much teaching. In my experience, it has been the influential women in my life that have taught me the most about this message by their words and their actions. So each month there's been a question to answer and we've gone through, as we've gone through this passage, we started with the first question taken from verses one and two. Who would not want a long, prosperous and peaceful life. Solomon suggests that if his children would simply listen, commit his teaching to memory, sear it into their hearts, and of course put it into practice, they would enjoy a long life of peace and prosperity. And I just want to remind us uh, at this point that the book of Proverbs is not necessarily a book of promises, but it's a book, I would say, of likely outcomes. You'll find some promises, I think, embedded, but it's mostly likely outcomes. So we started that first uh, message with this challenge. The challenge is always to put ourselves in the way of good teaching, the kind of teaching that Solomon is going to share with his kids. To commit that teaching to memory, allow it to impact our minds and our hearts. I suggested that if you were looking for good teaching, you might want to just start in the book of Matthew. If you do, you will, likely, you will find that likely outcome that Solomon suggests, a long life of peace and prosperity. Don't just take my word for it, or quite frankly, Solomon's word for it. Let's take Jesus' word for it. You know, Jesus, I, I, I shared this before, it start with Matthew, and we very quickly get to Matthew 5 to 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus begins that by talking about people being blessed by certain things, or in some versions, even happy are people that do these things. And he includes things like uh, those that are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who live full of mercy. And he suggests that, if I can coin it in my words, he suggests that if you do those things, you'll enjoy a long, peaceful, prosperous life. And, and then Jesus, <laughs> when he gets to the end of that teaching, and re, as recorded by Matthew in Matthew 7, at the end, Jesus uses the, these words to conclude. He says, if you listen to my teaching, put it into practice, you'll be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. I'd like to think that you'll be a wise person who will live long in prosperity and peace. Sounds a lot like what Solomon said. One of my favorite stories, if you want to keep going, uh, is uh, just in some recent studies, I've been looking at uh, the Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well. And he tells her, if she just listened and understand what he had to say, that she would actually never thirst. I'd like to say, I'd like to think that what Jesus was saying is that if she listened, that she would live a long, peaceful, prosperous life. One more, one more uh, verse that I shared previously, uh, one my mom always constantly reminded me of, and that was Jeremiah 29, 11, familiar to many of us, where God tells us that he has a plan for us. And that plan is to prosper us, not to harm us, a plan to give us hope and a future, a life of peace and prosperity. So to get in the way of good teaching, you really don't have to go further than scripture. 
there are a lot of good teachers out there today. COVID has forced us to the internet for church, uh, and there's a lot of good preaching out there. Look for it. There's great stuff out there. There are great books. Ask some about, someone about their favorite book and why it uh, was, was good for them, and maybe go and read that. And if you, you want that personal touch, you know, you, you could ask someone to disciple you. I think it's a great experience. But whatever, put yourself in the way of good teaching. So the second question taken from verses three and four, who doesn't want a good name in the sight of God, let alone man? I had some fun looking up uh, the most influential people in history. And I came across Time Magazine's rankings. Now, Time Magazine, did they get it all right? <laughs> I don't know, but they certainly got it right with number one. Time Magazine ranks Jesus as the most influential person in world history. Now, following Jesus at number two is Napoleon, so that's kind of an interesting number two. The only living person on that list of the top 100 is George W. Bush. And by the way, Elvis comes in at 69. If I was to rank the most influential people I've come into contact with that would have that kind of a reputation, they'd be people that, in my opinion only, would have a good name in the sight of God and man. That would include my mom and my wife, Sandy. It would include people like my brother, Ted, or Bobby Clark, or my daughter-in-law's new mother-in-law, Gray Zarazzo, in, in Ecuador. What do these people have in common? They exude love and faithfulness. And that's exactly what Solomon said. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Engrave those qualities into your heart so that when people watch you or people listen to you, what they see and hear is love and faithfulness. And Solomon says, you'll have a good name. So let those God character qualities be the filter through which your every word, your every action, your every reaction flow. And as Solomon says, the likely outcome, you will, be, you will have a good name before God and man. And husbands, you'll have a good name before your wife. Or dads, a good name before your kids. The third question taken from verses 5 through 8 was, in whom do we trust? As Jesus followers, in whom do we trust? When Solomon put these thoughts out there for consideration, it was because he knew likely from his own experience that it's so easy to put our trust in ourselves. Trust in me. Do we really trust in Jesus? If we did, going a little bit further in Matthew, we'd stop worrying. Go to Matthew 6, 25 to 34, and Jesus talks about worrying. Worry comes so natural to us. Why? Because we trust in ourselves or in others around us. I think even about being loving and faithful in that challenge and, and then think, how on earth am I ever going to succeed? Jesus' response was, well, consider nature. And he specifically talks about the birds and how God cares so much for the birds. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and stop trying to figure it out on your own. And then submit to him and his ways. And what does that mean? Let love and faithfulness never leave you. The second part of that message was about pride and the destruction that is brought about by pride. Stop thinking that, we've, that you've made it no matter how things are. In every situ situation, whether good or bad, trust in the Lord and put aside thinking that you have all the answers. What does that mean? <laughs> Let love and faithfulness never leave you. So in whom do I trust? Do I trust Jesus to empower me to love? Do I believe him when he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Then a moment later he says, now, Remain in my love. And I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. How? Here it is one more time. Jesus' command, love each other as I have loved you. And here is what love is. Greater love 
has no one than this but to lay down one's life for one's friend. Let love and faithfulness never leave you and trust in the Lord with all your heart in all humility. So, put your way, put, sorry, put yourself in the way of good teaching. Listen, learn, and put it into practice. Start with the teaching of Jesus. Let love and faithfulness be the God character through which your every word, your every action, and your every reaction flow. Trust in Jesus to empower you, allowing him onto the throne of your heart and mind and follow his teaching and his leading. And one final thought here from Solomon in these verses and the question for verses 9 and 10. How much do you really care? Solomon says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Did you know that you are wealthy? When you get Google the wealthiest person in Canada, you will find David Thompson of Thomson Reuters. Would you in any way consider yourself as wealthy as David Thompson? I'm here to suggest that you are. So think about this for a second and a little riddle. What do you and David have in common that no matter how much money you have, you can't buy more of, and once you use it, you'll never get it back? There is something, and it is clearly priceless. We are all equally wealthy. We've been all equally gifted with this wealth. In Canada, the average life expectancy is 82 years of age. That works for you and for David Thompson. That means that both you, David, and I, we all have 82 years, just over 43 million minutes to use in any way that we'd like. But once we use them up, we can't buy them back. We can never get them back again. So did you know that if you lived 82 years and you spent one third of that time sleeping, but the rest of the time you had the gift of time to give, you could on the average gift almost 29 million minutes of your time. Now, if you were a guy, you would probably spend a good part of that doing what guys like to do more than anything, nothing. Perhaps that is why this teaching from Solomon was aimed at his sons. So let's take this a bit further. The average person speaks 150 words per minute, which means you could gift 4.35 billion words in your lifetime. Solomon says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with your first fruits. How much do you really care? Who comes first in your life? I live with a woman who has at least 25 people that come before her. And that would include her grandchildren, her kids, her kids-in-law, and of course, at number 25, me. Then she feels bad that she can't reach more, but she does her best to try. Sandy understands first fruits even though she doesn't believe it. <laughs> so let's make this math come a bit closer to home. Imagine now as mom and dad, what it means to give your first fruits to your kids. We spend so much time working to provide, and by the time we're ready to give that time and those words to our kids, we're exhausted. Solomon says that you may want to consider your first fruits. How often as parents, is our first response, not right now. I know I'm being unreasonable with this, but maybe sometimes we may want to consider saying, yes, sure, let's do it right now. That's first fruits. Let's imagine for a second. <laughs> uh, when I said second, I, I was thinking, I, I was driving down Road 34, I think it is, south of Guelph, and there's a, the little Crossroads Church, and they always have a sign out there with a new message, and their message, uh, this week was uh, you have been gifted with 86,400 seconds tomorrow. <laughs> so imagine for a second with me, we have our kids for 18 years. Let's say, you know, when they graduate high school, they leave. In those 18 years, if we give them just 5% of our time before anything else, in those 18 years, 
we would invest 473,000 minutes into our kids. Now you're probably listening to this thinking all this math is giving me a headache, just like my kids give me a headache, and I give way more than 5% of my time to my kids. Okay, if we spent it talking to them, that 5%, in that 5%, we would invest 71 million words into them. <laughs> this could be where it starts to hit home. Imagine now that those 71 million words were words of love and encouragement. Think about that for a minute. The impact that 71 million words of encouragement to our children from the most important person that they will have to encourage them in their life. That's first fruits. I could go on talking about our words, but you have to recognize just how fabulously wealthy you are. Okay, so you work eight hours a day. 45 years, if you start working when you're 20 and you retire when you're 65, that's an unbelievable 5.6 million minutes to show love, kindness, encouraging with your words and building others up. That's first fruits. In every one of these situations, you can also waste that time. You can throw those minutes away with actions and reactions that are absent of love and words that are discouraging and tear others down. Love and faithfulness given generously, that is first fruits. So notice, I've probably been speaking for a good five minutes about being generous in this way. And I haven't for once mentioned money. I spoke to a nephew of mine, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Uh, we were actually uh, in a hospital and he was on a dialysis machine and I was preaching about love, faithfulness, and generosity. And uh, he uh, stopped me at one point and he said, uh, but Uncle Mark, I don't have the money that you have to give away. And I quickly said that money is the last thing on the list. We all have words and actions that we can use to make a huge impact on people's lives and those lives that are closest to us and those lives that aren't. Solomon says, make giving that wealth away a priority. And what will happen? You'll have so much more to give. So let's talk about money for a minute or two. This is really where the rubber hits the road for a lot of people. I have a public service announcement for Grace Community Church that no one asked me to make, but I'll make it anyhow. I don't think it would be taking these verses out of context when I would use this message about tithing. I have my own personal feelings about giving, but they do include tithing to the local church that I attend. In this case, I think Solomon would suggest once again that we should always give out of our first fruits. Tithing should never be from what's left over, but always taken care of first. And I wouldn't go as far as to say, here's what you should do, but I could suggest, you know, pick a number. It could be a percentage, it just could be something, but pick, pick something, make a commitment, and give it first. That's it. I can go on to talk about money, and it's obviously something that we really all have a hard time parting with. We have bills to pay, we got food to put on the table, the list is absolutely endless. But it's a question that needs answering. How important is it to give the first fruits when it comes to our money? This is where that tough question comes into play, how much do you really care? When a need presents itself, are we willing to put our limited financial resources behind it? I don't wanna go overboard on this discussion really but it, again, it's such a good resource to measure our caring on, but it's not the only one. My father was the one who planted that DNA into his kids. At his funeral, um, Kevin and I uh, were approached by a guy, we had no idea who he was, and he said he wanted just to talk to us, to say thank you to us, because our father had helped him years and years prior to, uh, to my dad's funeral, when he was in desperate need. And he said, you know, he never asked for a nickel back. Our dad always 
gave his financial first fruits. I was wondering if I'd tell the story, but I'm going to go ahead. A uh, little story about my dad. It's kind of a fun one. Uh, my dad, uh, in the 50s, and for those of you who have no clue what that is, that's the 1950s, uh, my dad uh, went ice fishing on Lake Muskoka with one of his very good friends, and that very good friend brought another friend. And that friend was a, a young man who was heading to the mission field in Africa. And my dad, who didn't have two nickels to rub together, said, well, what can I do for you? Uh, and my dad was serious, and the guy said, well, you know, what I really need now is transportation. I, I, uh, I think the best thing for me would be a motorcycle, uh, that uh, there's no real roads where I'm going, so you know, I can go through the bush uh, on paths and that sort of thing to get from village to village. So a motorcycle would be great. My dad said, awesome, I'll buy you a motorcycle. So uh, a few years went by and that missionary left the mission field. Another young family went out there and uh, he passed that motorcycle on to that young family. Fast forward, about 20, probably 20 years, maybe 25 years. And that, this uh, um, missionary was on his way to Africa and he came to our home and he and my dad were sitting there chatting. And uh, my dad said, uh, was talking about where he was going. He said, you know, I knew a missionary that went there, a guy by the name of such and such. And, uh, and so uh, uh, this guy said, oh yeah, I know that guy. In fact, when he left the mission field, he gave me his motorcycle. <laughs> what a great story. Uh, but that's actually not the end of the story. That motorcycle was actually used as a dowry, you know, required in Africa when you want to marry a daughter. Uh, because that guy that my dad was talking to was my father-in-law. <laughs> cool story about my dad and first fruits. God has blessed us. Whether we see it or believe it or not, he has given us such great giftings. The cool thing is that he's gifted us with all kinds of var a variety of different capabilities. Uh, Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, he talks about all kinds of different giftings that people have been given. You can read in 1 Corinthians 12 about all these gifts. And he ends that portion of his, of his message with these words. And yet, I show you the most excellent way and then he goes into what many of us know as the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, which talks about love. That's the most excellent way, and he ends that teaching with these words. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So in love, let's use those gifts that we've been given in abundance as our first fruits to honor God. Solomon says, if you do, you will enjoy the results of being an excellent farmer, full barns and overflowing vats. Take a moment with me, as I did as I was preparing, to think about that person who freely gives their gift away. I thought about my brother-in-law, Ron, who passed away many years ago. Ron was given the gift of listening. He was extraordinary in listening. Ron could take you into a room and make you feel like you were the only person in the world and he desperately wanted to listen. Ron gave his first fruits by making you feel like you were the most important person in his life at that moment. You know, I'll never forget, I've seen Bobby Clark in action a lot of times, but I won't forget the time that we were downtown Toronto and Bobby got down on his knees and hugged a guy lying on the street and told him that he loved him. He gave him five bucks and gave him that pen that says, Jesus loves you. And he said, man, I love you. And uh, you know, that's not for show. That's how Bobby gives his first fruits. Do you know someone who always says, or almost always says, thank you? almost always uses words of encouragement, almost always is the first one there to offer help. When I think about the history, my history in this church, I think about people like Kathy, or like um, Kitty Bites, or Kathy Antelik, now Kathy Getz, or Tina Clark, or Cheryl Teasel. They all have that concept of first fruits, being the first to jump in whenever and wherever help is needed. I'm sorry if I didn't mention your name, but they were just four that I thought of as I was preparing. 
Tomorrow, you will have 16 hours, 960 minutes. You have the potential for 144,000 words. If you listen twice as much as you speak, which I'm not very good at that, but uh, we can knock that down to a maximum of 48,000 words. Okay, let's be real realistic. Let's say you only speak about 10% of that time. This still means that you have the potential to give away 14,400 words that can be encouraging rather than discouraging. Lifting up rather than tearing down. Building into others' lives rather than building yourself up. You can gift your first fruits. Imagine the wealth that you can give away tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll have 16 hours, 960, to, uh, sorry, 16 hours, 960 minutes to be kind, to be gentle, to be a peacemaker, to be a servant. So you got to go to work tomorrow, eight hours. Wow, you've got eight hours. A day at work to give your first fruits of love in your words and your actions and your reactions. Then when we get home, guess what? We can do the same. As I was writing this and thinking through these numbers, and obviously, I love numbers. They were frightening me. At my age, how many minutes, how many words, how many actions, how many reactions have I wasted? How much of that wealth that I was given, those 29 million minutes, have I really spent giving of my words and actions in love? Solomon may have been thinking the same way as I am today when he was recording these thoughts. He may have also been recognizing the wealth that we get in return when we do invest that wealth. And that we have been given in love and faithfulness to others. What happens when you invest your words of kindness into another person? Well, logically, it would seem, they would typically invest like words back towards you in kindness. What happens when you carry out acts of kindness towards others? The likely outcome is that those acts of, come, acts of kindness come back at you. Is this great wisdom or just common sense? I'd like to say, suggest that if it was common sense, maybe we would practice it a whole lot more. Maybe we'd practice it all the time. I think it's better noted as great wisdom coming from the source of great wisdom. And that source can empower us to use that great wisdom. Solomon says, if you would just listen to my teaching and commit it to your heart, to your heart and then go out and be loving and faithful. Let that God character be what you filter your every word, your every action, your every reaction through. And when you're struggling, remember that it is not in your strength that you do this, but through the power that Jesus so desperately wants to pour into you. And when you meet with success, remember the source of that success. It was not you, but Jesus. And by the way, this is not something you begin to think about when you have some time. It is something you do with the first moments of your day, and then the next moments of your day, and then the next moments of your day until the day is done giving your first fruits. If you do, you will very likely enjoy a life, a long life of peace and prosperity with a good reputation before God and man, walking what seems like straight roads, enjoying such healthy relationships, so much so we will be rich in relationship beyond anything we can imagine. Let's pray. Father, we again are so thankful for your love faithfulness, and generosity. Help us to trust in Jesus, to submit to your ways and practice those qualities in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.